Welcome to Reconciliation Road, an exciting new podcast hosted by the team at Four Directions Management Services. Here on Reconciliation Road, we seek to build bridges of better understanding with the hopes of creating a markedly different future for our children and grandchildren than the often painful memories of our elders. I believe we all have a role to play in this journey we call reconciliation, and I seek to understand and celebrate the good work being done right now with the game changers, the trailblazers, and the movers and the shakers. We know that reconciliation is a journey, not a destination. The road to reconciliation is a long and winding one with many stops along the way. When we come together, great things happen. So I want to extend my appreciation to you for joining me on this journey. I also want to acknowledge the First Nations Major Projects Coalition who sponsor in part this podcast. My guest for this episode is the talented, dynamic, and funny Kukbi Mike Laborje. Kuki Mike Laborje is Chief of Whispering Pines Clinton Indian Band. He is Executive Vice President for the Western Indigenous Pipeline Group, Chairman of Tulo Center of Indigenous Economics, and sits as a Director for Cayuse Creek Developments. Kuki Laborje has served as Director of All Nations Trust Company, Chairman of the Native Economic Development Advisory Board, Co-Chairman of the Shushwap Nation Travel Council, and Business Development Officer for the Community Futures Development Corporation of Central Interior First Nations. Kukbi Labordi brings a wealth of knowledge and skill with them, having worked with First Nations in Canada, the USA, and New Zealand. He has experience working in the areas of jurisdiction, taxation, forestry, pipelines, revenue sharing, independent risk assessment, and more. Kukbi Mike is heavily invested in the acquisition of the Trans Mountain Pipeline by the Indigenous communities along its route, seeing the returns brought back into the rightful territories who are bearing the risk with this expansion. He is an outspoken and passionate voice for the advancement of Aboriginal title and rights and a tireless advocate working to see the benefits of natural resources and protection of the environment in Indigenous traditional territories returned to its people. Hi, Kukbi Mike. Thanks so much for joining me. Uh, thanks for the invitation, Dan. Look forward to it. Right on, brother. Um, the theme, uh, as you know, of my podcast is reconciliation. What does that concept mean to you? It's like a word that's been thrown around all over. What does it mean to you, Kukbi? I guess it means a couple of things. Um, for, I'm going to speak largely to, you know, what it is we think and feel in the Shushwap Nation here in central interior of British Columbia. Um, for us, it, it, it has more to do with um, understanding that uh, before Canada wrote the Indian Act that we enjoyed a level of jurisdiction and authority over the territory that we don't have today, right? Uh, they confined us to Indian reservations, stripped away all of our cultural um, goings on such as, you know, our ceremonies and, and potlatches and lawmaking abilities and reduced it to the Indian Act. Um, and so for us, reconciliation, um, getting back to the day Canada became a country. And so on that day, um, we both Canadians and First Nations enjoyed a level of um, autonomy. They enjoyed a level of jurisdiction that we don't see today. Uh, we had control of our families, we had control of our children, we had an influence and a say in the territories of the environment, what trade occurred, we had fur traders come in, we had Hudson Bay Company come in, CN, CP, all this stuff, and all these people worked together with First Nations. And so um, when the Indian Act came along, it reduced all of that into limiting our influence over anything and, and basically starving us into submission. And so what reconciliation means to, to us at uh, Shushwap Nation is, is recognize, we recognize that early. Uh, 1910, the, the chiefs of Tecumaloops and, and Maritown went to Ottawa and met with um, the Prime Minister, uh, Sir Wilfred Laurier, and they hashed out uh, um, the memorial, which describes what it is we want to do. And in that memorial, it describes that we want to share in everything and help each other to be good and great. It's one of the most common used lines from the memorial. 
And so it's not that we want more than Canadians, we want to be equal to Canadians because we're not. Under the Indian Act, we are not equal to Canadians. We don't own our homes, we don't own our land, we don't have fresh drinking water, all of this stuff. We have higher, uh, lower life expectancy, higher health issues, all that kind of stuff. And so we wanna to get to the place where we're equal as Canadians and that's what was described in, in 1910, the memorial. And so that's what we want. We want to be equal to Canadians, and, and we're trying to achieve that through uh, cooperation by Ottawa to amend Canadian laws so that we can do that. Thank you, Cookby. Um, keeping on with the reconciliation theme, um, recently 215 plus bodies of children were located on the grounds of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. Um, big media all, all around that. and. Um, we're starting to see, um, you know, all across this country and into the United States, um, other um, children's uh, bodies are being uh, located as well. This coming Thursday, September 30th, is a day of commemoration. And every year since 2013, Orange Shirt Day has aimed to raise awareness of the Indian residential school system in Canada. The federal government has now officially marked that date as the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation and our BC government has followed suit. The National Day for Truth and Reconciliation is uh, an opportunity to recognize and commemorate the legacy of residential schools. Uh, Cookby, how can our listeners use this day to advance their personal understanding of reconciliation in this country? What can they do more than just wearing a red, an orange shirt? Well, that's, that's, that's the good start, right, is the orange shirt. I remember the day that... Um, you know, Cookie Roseanne was on, on the radio and, and uh, the 215 came out. I was at my mother's and my aunts were there, my mother's sisters. And so in our, in our language, it's, it's Kikwa. And so that means aunt on my mother's side. And so we were there, they were there for a different reason. And, um, when that came out, it was very, very hard on them. They are the strongest women I know. Um, my mother, she had eight sisters. Uh, there's only uh, three of them left. And so they started to share their stories. And, you know, I think I have some bad days every now and then. I think my life's tough every now and then, and it's not. It really isn't compared to the, the, the crap that my mother, my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, what they've had to endure at the hands of uh, the residential schools, particularly the Camelops Indian Residential School. My mother's from Lillooet. And so all of those in Lillooet went to Camelops Indian Residential School or uh, uh, St. Anne's Academy. And so a lot of tears were shed that day. And, and what, what we want Canadians to understand is how bad it was. We're always seen as a burden to Canada. And quite frankly, it's the other way around. Uh, Canada is a burden on First Nations. Canada enjoys our resources, the trees, the coal, the copper, the nickel, the gold, the water. They remove us and uh, put us on reservation so that they can have unfettered access to First Nations resources. Um, and so this is what we need Canadians to understand, not only by wearing uh, an orange shirt and recognizing that it's the beginning of recognizing that there was injustice, there is injustice, and that we need to reconcile that by amending the laws of this country so that I'm just as Canadian as everybody else because it, it, it's not that way today. We're um, looked at as second or third class citizens when you do the uh, UN uh, measurement on you know, where we are in the world. We're somewhere around 43 or somewhere in Canada that enjoys a status of you know, top five. We're not near there, like on my reserve here. Now, we're not on the uh, drinking water advisory, um, although 
I don't have fresh drinking water here. I can't turn on the tap and have a, a glass of water. We make sure that when INAC comes here, we have a pitcher of water from the tap and it just sits there and they don't drink it because they know it's not fit to drink. And so this goes on on so many reserves. It's, it's literally a pond. And then we don't have uh, adequate housing. We are forced, our, our, our membership is forced off the reserve into provincial jurisdiction which is not First Nations, which they don't care about the environment the way we do, they don't care about the fish the way we do, they don't care about the water the way we do. And so all of those things are uh, alien to us. And so reconciliation means to us is, is leveling the playing field so where the laws that apply to Canadians can also be enjoyed by First Nations on reserve. But it also means that an understanding of how it is we lived in harmony with the environment for so many thousands of years. And so, and that we can do that again. We can weave some of that fabric from the First Nations side into the Canadian side and, and have a better tomorrow for all of us, for all of our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. Because today, some, some of the industries that we see today, uh, mining and stuff like that probably aren't sustainable. Mm -hmm. I've been to mines where they have tailings ponds that are, um, will condemn a lake for 10,000 years. And I'm like, how is that sustainable when you're contaminating the land for 10,000 years? That's far beyond the seven generation thinking that First Nations have. And so if, if you have to contaminate the land for 10,000 years, you probably shouldn't be doing mining or that kind of mining. We're, like I said, we're not opposed to development, we're opposed to irresponsible development. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what we're trying to have people understand. We can do this together and we can do this properly. We just need to level the playing field. And that's what basically re reconciliation means. And that's, that's how it starts with wearing that orange shirt and getting out there and, and knowing your First Nations territories that you live on and understanding that there, there was a language and a culture there long before David Thompson and Columbus and all those guys were wandering across our country. Yeah, tremendous disruption uh, of our lives um, through colonization and the creation of the residential schools. And uh, as you speak to Kukbi, uh, the, the Indian Act. And one of the biggest byproducts of that has been the sadly that poverty has been normalized in far too many of our families. Prior to contact, there was no real poverty, right? Because everybody had that sense of community and uh, and supporting of one another. And what I witness in the work that I do is so often we are marginalized within the per periphery of the socioeconomic fabric of our territories. Others are getting rich around us at our expense, using our resources while we wallow in uh, in poverty. Um, you are the executive vice president of the Western Indigenous Pipeline Group, and um, you have a vision for the Indigenous pur purchase of the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the long-term uh, work and benefit of that acquisition. Why is that important, um, Kukbi, um, to, to get involved at that level? Because that's really in the big leagues. Why is that important? Well, I guess that goes back to... Um... TULO, the TULO Center of Indigenous Economics. And so when I was in, <laughs> I first started out to be a mechanic, and then I went to BCIT for resource management, and then I went to uh, University College of the Caribou before it was TRU in, in economics. Um, I was encouraged to, from resource management, uh, to go into economics. And when I was in my third year of economics at TRU, I understood that none of the economic policies, um, practices, um, products that they were teaching us would apply on reserve. Mm -hmm. Because it's, if it was as simple as taking an economist and putting them on the Indian reserve and solve all the Indians problems, we'd have done that a long time ago, but that's not. That's not what the problem is. The problem itself is the Indian Act. 
And so we're always looking for opportunities to participate in resource development projects off reserve. And so when um, 2007, when Ian Anderson came and said he had bought the pipeline, I was looking at him and I said, no, Del Gamuk was very clear in the 1990s that you had to consult and accommodate. I said, I've not seen any consultation or accommodation. And so the, in Del Gamuk, there's a line in there that says that there's an inescapable economic component that First Nations enjoy. And so that's what triggered us into um, ban having our, our, our collective First Nations along the pipeline work together to get um, Ottawa's attention so that, and uh, then Kinder Morgan's attention so that they would understand that consultation and accommodation is a, is a requirement. For us here at Whisper Pines, part of the accommodation we wanted was equity. Because equity, the, the pipeline was projected to build out and last another 70 years. And so if we had 70 years of income coming in for Whisper Pines Clinton Indian Band, that would be we'd be good. We wouldn't solely have to rely on Ottawa's, what Ottawa thinks we need and what, what we get are two different things. And so that's what led to that. Um, we petitioned then um, Minister um, Jim Flaherty. He was very open to that idea. He liked that idea uh, through our uh, MP, Kathy McLeod at the time, um, got us a meeting with Jim Flaherty. We spoke to him, he came to Canada, so I spoke to him, I gifted him a drum. We, we talked about equity. And so more and more, the First Nations come together and, and we work in out deals with uh, Kinder Morgan and now Canada. And so, what happened is Kinder Morgan was going to leave. And so they're going to have to sell the pipeline again. And so instead of waiting for another pipeline company to come along and purchase the pipeline, we had enough um, expertise and we had enough understanding from the financial institutes in Canada that we could purchase the pipeline. So we formed the Western Indigenous Pipeline Group. So what it is, it, it's the um, Alberta First Nations, the North Thompson, Nicola Valley, Fraser Valley, and the Salish Sea. So these five groups would come together and form the Western Indigenous Pipeline Group. And together we seek to purchase 50% of the pipeline and the other 50 would be purchased by our operator. And so that's how we, um, petitioned different banks, Toronto Dominion, uh, Bank of Montreal, CIBC. We're currently working with CIBC so that we could uh, use their expertise in understanding and attracting uh, international finance so that when we do come around to buying the pipeline, um, we can get um, good rates and enjoy the rates that you know other pipeline companies like Kinder Morgan and whatnot would enjoy. And so that's the whole focus in the whole point of purchasing the pipeline. Now, why we want to do it is the 70 years of income. That's, that's a no brainer. The other part is we, we saw that when we're negotiating mutual benefits agreements, no matter how well they're written, they can be ignored. And so when they ignore them, they being owners, Ken Morgan or Canada, it is very hard to reconcile that. And so what we're thinking, well, if we own it, then we'll have our own environmental oversight for the 70 years. Because mm -hmm. right now we have environmental oversight for five. That's it. And then 65, nothing. And so what we wanted was the environmental oversight for the length of the project. And so, and, and by that we mean not only do we mean oversight, but to be able to have the resources to make those adjustments that are required. In the North Thompson Valley here, where we have um, uh, spawning beds, you know, uh, the Chinook, mm -hmm. the Sockeye, the, the Pinks, 
all, they all use the North Thompson River to spawn. It's very important. Um, so when the salmon habitat gets um, to the point where they can't use it anymore, it needs to be rehabilitated so that the salmon can come back and spawn and continue to use those areas which are corrupted either by logging or, or development or, or pipeline development. And so we need to change that and make sure it's up to what we want to see, not necessarily what somebody in Houston, Texas wants to see or in Ottawa wants to see. Somebody at Whisper and Pines wants to see or Simp or Kamloops or Merritt. That's what we want. We want that down. We're, we're the ones who bear the risk. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that want the oversight. Uh, you know, we have a lot of interest from groups in Saskatchewan, from, you know, groups in Alberta who, who are, don't necessarily live along the right of way. And so it, it speaks to whether or not they're as impacted as we are. The pipe runs right beside my sister's house. And my mother's house is on the other side of it. And so we're impacted. We, we think about it constantly. We cross over the pipeline daily. I already drove over it four times today. And so it's always in our minds, um, the safety of the pipeline, not only here, but what's it like for our neighbors south of us, Black Pines. They're, they're constantly talking to me about their issues with the pipeline companies and, and what they can and cannot do. And so those are the kinds of things that we wanted to see with ownership, you know, have a, a better ownership structure. Leave that money here in BC. Don't send it to Fortis over in Newfoundland. Don't send it to Texas in Houston. Leave it here in Alberta, in North Thompson, in, in Nicola Valley, in the Fraser Valley, in the Salish Sea. Leave it with those First Nations who could use that, those resources to make a better future for our children and our grandchildren, those seven generations that we constantly talk about. That's what we want to see with ownership of this pipeline. So Trans Mountain could be is owned by the federal government. And what can the federal government do, you know, essentially to get out of your way so that you can realize the vision that you just that you just shared? Well, what we want to do is have a, you know, a sit down conversation with the, the Minister of Finance and, and Cabinet and say, this is how we propose to purchase the pipeline. Certainly, we would like some some support from the Canadian government. They were going to support Kinder Morgan. In, in, in purchasing the pipe, they're going to indemnify them. So we want uh, literally to be equals and to be the same as those guys. We would like that, su that support, whether it be loan guarantees or what have you, those kinds of things that we need to talk about with cabinet. And so we need all parties to understand what it is we're trying to achieve. The liberals, the conservatives, the greens, the NDP, all of them. And so we need them to understand that this is what we want. Mm -hmm. and this is how we can get it and this is how you can support us early on in your comments you referenced uh delgamook uh, the delgamook Gustaway court action and that was uh, led by the uh, hereditary chiefs of the Wet'suwet'en and the the gitsan and in 1997 uh, we left the supreme court of canada and we entered into the bc treaty commission process um understanding at that point in time that the menu that was being offered by the crown was inconsistent with the arguments that we brought forward in the supreme court of canada but we took the money anyway to be able to organize ourselves on the land base as we know how um, one of the people one of the thought leaders that we reached out to was a fellow by the name of tommy shoyama and tommy made a comment uh, that's that that has always stuck with me and he said the power to tax is the power to govern, mm -hmm. right? And, and so you have been a vocal advocate and leader behind the concept of an Aboriginal resource tax. Can you please explain that concept to our listeners and share how you think such an initiative could support Indigenous jurisdiction while still, you know, upholding the needs of the environment and, um, you know, values on the land that we all hold dear? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... um. That's not new for us. Like you say, uh, like Tommy said, it, it's, it, we, we've always had a tax. We just didn't call it tax. We just, you know, there's a, there's a Chinook term taxes. And then, um, but mostly we just call it sharing. So to give you an idea here in the Shoe Shop Nation, we would travel from, um, we would have our potlatch at Green Lake, which is part of uh, our traditional territory. We'd go to Green Lake, the chiefs would gather, the 32 chiefs, 
and we would discuss hunting and fishing. We were the middlemen between the coast and the prairie trade routes, all that kind of stuff. And then we would identify hunting grounds, fishing grounds, who got what, that kind of thing. And so there was a, there was a jurisdiction over everything. Um, also, who was not as well off as everybody else? Who was in need? Who needed foodstuffs, uh, furs and whatnot to get through the winter? And so those with more would share with those who had less. It's called sharing, but it's also can be called a tax because it's a redistribution of wealth. And so we've always had that concept. And so we, when we think about the Aboriginal resource tax, it's uh, what it is, what proposed on is to turn, let's, let's take for example, the pipeline. If we participated in taxing the pipeline, again, it, you would benefit the First Nations in Alberta, North Thompson Valley, Nicola Valley, Fraser Valley, and the Salish Sea. And it would be paid for by corporations, mm. right? This is exporting oil to China. And so the corporations would sell the oil to China, China would buy it. So literally it's an, in, you're, you're taxing international folks for Canadian products. And so that's how that would work. And so we would like to see a resource tax, a resource fee on, you know, exports like oil and gas, like lumber, like coal, like gold, nickel, copper. So it wouldn't be a people tax or a productivity tax, but a resource tax. Because in British Columbia here, it's, it's the resources we are not in, in treaty. We haven't surrendered that stuff. And so we like to enjoy a certain level of tax so that we can improve our water, improve our reserves, and you know, send our kids to school, that kind of thing. And so this tax, it wouldn't impact Canadians as such, it would impact uh, the international markets and um, improve the quality of life quite significantly on reserve. And so that's what the whole point around the Aboriginal resource tax is. So thank you. I just want to get some rapid fire questions in front of you here. Jeans or sweats, Mike? Jeans always, and particularly Wranglers. I don't, uh, I don't wear anything else. I got a pair of cinch jeans for once. I cut them off and I use them when I'm bailing hay. So you're not wearing seafarers or none of that? No, just, just Wranglers? Oh, uh, my, my brother-in-law wears Lululemons, and uh, I told him don't come here anymore. You're not allowed at your place anymore. Cowboy hat or ball cap? Uh, I own one ball cap. It's a Toronto Blue Jays ball cap. And about 20, 25 cowboy hats. Okay, mullet or kuka? <laughs> <laughs> I got the mullet on growth. Uh, I haven't got, I went to do a speech in, people say, how do you know when you got your hair cut last? I did a speech in uh, Calgary on March 9th. I flew to Calgary March 9th, 2020. I did a speech on March 10th and 11th and I flew back. I got my hair cut March 6th because I, I have this, <laughs> my, my brother-in-law says, the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut is three days. So in case they screw up my hair, it has three days to fix itself. And so I got my hair cut on March 6th, went and did my speeches, and then COVID came and locked us all down. And I haven't had a haircut since. So it's just been, I want to have a braid once in my life, is basically what I'm trying to achieve here with this wicked mullet. Yeah, I'm just admiring, uh, look, look at mine. Like, I don't got none. You know, like, <laughs> look at you. How about head and shoulders or Old Spice? Uh, I use uh, both, uh, head and shoulders. Uh, every Monday, I wash my hair with head and shoulders just once a week. I don't want to strip away the natural oils. And then uh, Old Spice on the weekends for the girls. Boxers or briefs? Uh, what, what's that called? Sacks? S-A-X-X? -X? Those ones that were on the Dragon's Den? Yeah. So I got a pair for uh, 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 my birthday, and so I've been... Those are awesome. Just thumbs up to Sam's. I don't know if they're boxers or briefs. They're, they're really good. Yeah, they hold your boys. Yeah. Yeah, holding the boys. Bacon or kale? What's kale? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, kale is what bacon eats. Okay, yeah. that's what that is. So That's what they say. You're supposed to cook uh, kale in uh, coconut oil, right? And then be, so it slides really easy out of the pan into the garbage. 
<laughs> when you throw it out, it slides out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the, uh, with everything going on in the world right now, you know, it's a, it seemed, you know, I'm, uh, I got another grandchild on the way. Uh, my youngest daughter, Brittany, I'm just, uh, her and her partner, Chris uh, announced that they're 12 weeks into their, their pregnancy. And, you know, I've got uh, three other grandchildren and I look around the world and I'm a little troubled by what I'm seeing um, uh, in the world. And, but there's also good out there. So with everything going on in the world right now, what excites you the most for the promise it holds for, you know, future generations of Indigenous people, you know, our young people? What's what's the future like for them that you see? Well, it's it's so amazing the opportunities that are before them. It's exciting to see the young leadership, uh, you know, um, I talk about the ones in Kamloops and, and in Vancouver, the ones I see the most. But when I travel, um, you know, before COVID came, we would go to New Zealand and we would go to Stanford at the Hoover Institute. And, and Andre and I would just go and sit in the coffee shop at Stanford and listen to the students talk to each other. And it's refreshing that there's schools like that with students like that that are thinking of uh, a better cleaner tomorrow right uh, and it's the same in New Zealand we would go to the University of Christchurch um, uh, in New Zealand on on the big island and engage with the 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 Ngaitaho there Ngaitaho are what the Maori call themselves there and so engage with them and they're you know, they're quite a bit smaller so everything they do impacts everybody and the land and so they're very very cognizant of uh, pollution and, and all that kind of stuff. And we, we, we wanna embrace that with them. Um, and so it, it's very refreshing that the opportunities that are available to the students at these universities, the problem is for us is we, we never have the resources to send our, uh, um, our best and our brightest to school. And that leads back to the Union Act where I don't have any, um, I don't own my home, I don't own the land. And that would leads to poverty, which leads to mur murdered and missing women and, and it links all that stuff together. But you have these great minds in these universities and um, sharing ideas about how to make a better tomorrow. And it's, it's very simple. It, it's quite literally amending the laws of Canada, amending the laws of the United States and amending the laws of New Zealand. And it, it's it's, quite doable. You can do it every time the, those legislatures sit. It's mm -hmm. just whether or not those legislatures have the wherewithal to do that for First Nations and, and Maori people. As part of your introduction, we noted that you are the kukbi for uh, Whispering Pines. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about Whispering Pines? They give them a kind of primer on your community, Mike. Um, it has a quite storied history. This is Indian Reserve number four. So we've been moved three times. Um, the village of Clinton, oh, well, even well before that, um, we're, we're called the Slamulu. Our name in, uh, in Shishwap means Slamulu. And so what it, Slamulu is, is there's a vine that grows down by the Fraser River and it, it's, it's a twisted vine. And so we're the twisted vine Indians of the Fraser River is, is what the, the translation would be. Um, and so we were, were, at that time, we were made up of uh, the Clinton Band, Plackett Band, the High Bar Band, the Big Bar Band, and the Empire Valley Band. And so um, two of those are now extinct. Uh, um, so the Big Bar is gone, and so only High Bar and Clinton remain. So in 1972, uh, well, even before that, when they're doing, um, when the first white man got here, um, it was estimated our numbers between those four bands was about 10,000. And so, and then when smallpox came through, it went down at Clinton to 22. So I think it was in 1902, there was, there was 22 uh, individuals that lived on the reserve. 
and uh, I, I can't remember the guy who wrote it. I think it was Trutch. He said there was more dogs on the reserve than there was Indians. And so we, we went from 22, we're just over 200 now. So we're kind of getting our growth back, but uh, that, that leads into another problem. Canada decides who's an Indian and who's not which I find fascinating to me. They don't decide who's German or Japanese, but they do decide who's an Indian. And so that's, that's that. But getting back to the original question on, on how we got here, um, we were moved from with the village side of Clinton to just outside of Clinton um, because it was a desirable place to live. They moved us. And so the place where we moved to, that was a desirable place. So they moved us again. Um, and then this last time in 1972, uh, BC Hydro wanted our reserve to build a power line to provide power from Steveston to the uh, to North Vancouver. So all the lights you see in Vancouver, um, they moved us to accommodate that. And so they moved us here in 1972. They offered us other places. They offered us a place up in Dawson Creek they offered a place down by Lytton. And so, and then this place was the third choice um, or it was one of three choices. We chose this one, quite frankly, my dad and my uncle Joe chose this one because this is still in the Shushwap Nation whereas the place up at Dawson Creek is not and the place in, in Lytton, although Nice Ranches was not in the Shushwap Nation, it was McCutton and uh, Treaty 8. Um, and so this is the place we wanted to be. We're uh, still near the Bonaparte Plateau. We're right beside another river and uh, we've come to make this home. Most of our, my little brother was born here. Uh, the rest of us were, most, uh, rest of us old guys were born and lived over in Clinton, but most of our population now uh, call this place home. Cool. What kind of music you listen to? Uh, classic rock, you know, I'm, I'm that, uh, well, I'll tell you, I've been to Buck Cherry, Aerosmith, ACDC, all that hard rock, 80s and 90s kind of stuff. I do enjoy some of the new country stars like Luke Combs, Eric Church, those kind of guys. I Because they, they're singing songs about their life. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I, I like that kind of uh, storytelling. That's what music uh, and poetry should be about, right? Uh, even Eminem, I like his his rap uh he, he tells some good stories in his raps and he's always got a message in there it's not just you know I'm drive fast and shoot somebody it, it's there's always a message in his his lyrics and so that but for me that's when I'm boogieing down the road it's usually just ACDC ACDC all the way right excellent um one of the things that we've heard and, and again I want to kind of we're getting near the end of our of our time together and I want to bring it back to September 30th and um, one of the things that um, we've heard people say is that many of us have a memory of convenience right we just remember those things that support our particular narrative that we want to uh, uh, perpetuate and so many of us um, many people in, in this country don't know our history right and and as a consequence, um, a lot of people say there is no reconciliation without the truth, mm -hmm. right? And so what is the truth that, uh, and you've spoken some of it today already, Kukbi, but what are some of the truths that Canadians need to keep in mind while they are uh, participating in an events on Thursday, September 30th? Well, they need to keep in mind that the, what this country is built on, right? It's, it's, it's built on literally our graves it's, it's built on i don't know how to how to how to how to say it it's it, it's built on us they, they took us and they put us on reserves because they did not want to share jurisdiction mm -hmm. it's that simple they wanted to um you know uh get the indian out of the child Right, so they wanted to do that using residential schools or the 60s scoop, like get the native out of the child and then we would be in sim assimilated into the Canadian fabric where, you know, you just, you extract resources and sell it and, and to hell with the environment. Um, and so that's, that's 
what it is today. What we want Canadians to understand is that we were doing trade very, very well with the colonizers, the, the what we call Shema, the people from Britain, the people from France. And so it was, it was fine. It's just that they didn't like sharing. And so when they wrote the Indian Act to remove us from sharing, it, it uh, you know, was a little bit greedy and it made things a little cheaper for them. And so that's what reconciliation is to us. Well, you know, we have a standard of living in Canada that's enjoyed by, uh, you know, a majority of Canadians and it's paid for by the First Nations mm -hmm. because we do not enjoy that level of comfort that Canadians do. We don't enjoy the proper health care. We don't enjoy the proper housing. We don't enjoy safe drinking water. I mean, all of these things that Canadians take for granted are issues on First Nations reserves. One of my counsel, Jack, he's, he, he hates to go to the tribal council meetings because he says the same, he says the agenda's the same as when my dad run this place. And so, and this is what I mean, it's, it takes decades to get something done on reserve because of, I don't, they don't care, they're incompetent, I, you know, pick, 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 a, pick an adjective. It's just, it's just the people who should be having the oversight on the reserves are the people who are here, like, like we're, you know, the people who should be um, enjoying the pipeline are the people who are most impacted by it. And so that's us, the people who are here. And so those are the kinds of things that we want Canadians to understand. We don't want anything more than y'all, but we would like to be equal. So we would like to own our own homes. We would like to have safe drinking water. We'd like to send our kids to school. We want to crawl our way out of poverty. I don't want a free house. None of these houses are free. We paid for them. The only problem is it's owned by the government. Mm -hmm. So I, I said this once to uh, um, the minister, oh, what was his name? He was, he was talking about free houses and I said, they're not free. I said, uh, my house is paid for. He lived in Fredericton. We were meeting in Fredericton. And I said, I'll trade you houses. Mine's paid for, yours is not. You want to do a trade? And he just, he went really quiet because then he understood how wrong it is for Canada to own our homes, even though we pay for it. And the example I use is, is imagine going and, and renting a motel room for your life. And then you pay for everything, but the, the owner gets all the money. And so that's, that's, that's how it is on reserve. It says we pay for everything, but we just don't own it. And it, it's um, kind of like little islands of communism or socialism across Canada. When I was in, uh, you know, I went to Cuba. First time I went to Cuba and I thought I saw all the, you know, it's a beautiful place. They got old, old Spanish style buildings and, and that kind of thing. The people are fantastic. Um, but their houses are falling down. And my, the, my friends that were with me, they, they didn't understand that uh, Cubans don't own their homes. It's all owned by uh, the party of uh, Fidel Castro. And so once I told them that, then they understood. I said, imagine Cuba is like one big Indian reserve. And you can live in the house, you just don't own it. And so now, then they understood what it was like on reserve. And this is why we get um, bitchy and pissy about the clean drinking water and, and home ownership. You know, they say, well, you live in it, you should fix it. Yeah, but I don't own it. The Indian Act says very clearly, section two, everything shall be held by her majesty. Ask any lawyer what that means. He says, well, it means the Canadian government owns it. And yet I have to pay all the bills. I would trade Justin Trudeau houses like that or any of those party leaders. If they all want to trade homes that they think we got it easy, let's trade. Other, otherwise, let's fix the Indian Act. Let's do some amendments so that we can get a little bit closer to reconciliation and a little bit closer to equality. 
So we encourage all of our, our friends, uh, fellow Canadians to um, educate themselves about um, our history, um, the true history, to create alliances with Indigenous people um, where possible, and to take action, right? It's one thing to say, I, I feel your pain, I acknowledge, I acknowledge what's going on. It's another thing to actually try and do something about it, eh, Kupi? Yes. Yes, it was um, like after the 215 came out, uh, you know, I'm quite active on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and my Facebook, we, I had kind of all these friend requests come in. So we were moved here in 1972. Um, and so we went to uh, public school, non-native school. I'm, I'm first in my family not to go to residential school. So my older brothers and my older sisters went. Everybody from me younger didn't. But we did attend uh, Westside Elementary School and Westside Senior Secondary. And it, you know, we're, we're six, six Indians in a school of a thousand. And so it was, um, you know, they didn't know anything back then. Well, I didn't know anything back then. Um, I just knew I was browner than everybody else. And so when the 215 came out, uh, I got all these friend requests from people I would went to school with that I didn't necessarily get along with. And, you know, there would be a request and I'd click on accept and then they would send me a message immediately just apologizing. Mm -hmm. I said, Mike, I didn't know. I didn't know. And I'm saying, I'm, yes, I, you know, I'm, that's all right. Let's let's share this these ideas and let's have this understanding so that uh, people can know what people like my mother and my aunts had to endure for Canada to be where they are. Mm -hmm. So you know, and you know, trying to get the the Indian out of the child, it didn't work. Um, it worked to some degree. You know, we're speaking English instead of Chinook. Um, but we can learn our languages. Most of our stories are, uh, I pass down as, as much stories as I can. Um, I remember my going fishing with my grandfather. He would tell, tell me stories I heard like a dozen times. And I'd roll my eyes and oh my God, he's telling the porcupine story again. Or, you know, and now I know why because that's how we learn. That's how he learned those stories, just being repetitive over and over and over. And then the lessons that come out of those stories, I'm finding new lessons of them all around. That coyote juggles his eyes. It's a funny story, but it, it, it teaches us geography. It teaches us uh, environment. It teaches us behaviors of uh, predators, of behaviors of birds, behaviors. Of... There's so many lessons in this one story. It's, it's remarkable. And so those are the kinds of things I think that I like imparting with my youth. I take them hunting and I tell them stories about the landscape or, or you know, what the hoodoos are in Kamloops and those kinds of things where the, you know, Kamloops Lake drained and now we have the city of Kamloops. Without that happening, this place can't exist. And mm -hmm. so that happened because of, you know, Coyote, he went to to the Fraser River and he made the, those necessary adjustments so the, the river could flow west instead of east down the, the Columbia water system and out of Portland. And so these are all throughout our oral history, but it's not taught anywhere in school. I have treaties with Wet'suwet'en. Shishwap have a treaty with Wet'suwet'en. Shushwap have a treaty with the Haida, Shushwap have a treaty with the Okanagan, Shushwap have a treaty with uh, Treaty 7, Shushwap have a treaty with the Stonies. Mm -hmm. And so none of these things are taught. I can guarantee you we don't break those treaties. We, we, we think about them, we don't interfere with each other, and we respect those treaties. And so when I tell this to people, like, uh, the Okanagan Municipal Association or the Sun Peaks Municipal Association and, and stuff like that, they're, they're shocked, right? And I said, well, why would you be shocked? We were, we're civilizations, we're communities, 
working together with other communities. In the true sense of treaty, you and I both know the BC treaty process is not a treaty process. It's a extinguishment process or something along that line. You know, when we have a treaty with, with the Wet'suwet'en, I don't get to say what, who's Wet'suwet'en and who's not, mm -hmm. and vice versa. You don't get to say who's Shushwap and who's not. And so we respect each other's autonomy and the treaty describes how we will we'll work together on certain issues, whether it be around labor management or resource extraction or politics or those, those kinds of things. And so those are the kinds of things that we're sharing at, you know, uh, the Tulo Center of Indigenous Economics on, on how to do that stuff with the Hoover Institute at Stanford, with the Naitaho uh, Institute at the University of Christchurch. And so it's, it's there's a, the glimmer of hope just got a little bit glimmy, lighter, brighter. And so it's exciting to see uh, the amount of people that participate at the Tulo Center of Indigenous Economics and graduate from there and then go on to lead that. I think the change for Canada and for First Nations is gonna be generational. It should be better for my kids and it should be better for my grandkids, hopefully. Um, but there are things that we can do immediately. We can do these amendments to the Indian Act so that we can own our homes. We can do amendments to the Indian Act so we can tax resources. We can do amendments to the Indian Act so that we can have safe drinking water. Those mm. are easy fixes and that, that can be accomplished in this term by this the current Canadian government. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Cookie Mike, for taking time of your busy schedule to be with us uh, on this episode of Reconciliation Road. When I uh, introduced you, um, Kukbi, I referenced you as being talented, dynamic, and funny. I also want to add uh, articulate and visionary. So I want to take a moment to acknowledge your leadership over the years, Kukbi. Uh, we know that becoming an effective leader is a character trait that many people strive for, and I know that you come from good people. An inspirational leader helps their organization, their community, and nation become more successful because of their effective leadership skills. Effective leaders don't avoid the hard truths. Instead, they take responsibility for their decisions, maintain optimism, and focus on charting a new course of action. They also help others cope with change and address issues quickly so that problems don't fester and escalate. Thank you, Koopy Mike, uh, for many years of service coupled with your stellar leadership skills. We know that there are many pressing demands on your schedule. You've chosen to be with us here, and for that, we are grateful. Uh, to my listeners, uh, please join me in future episodes of Reconciliation Road, where I will in introduce exciting change agents like Koopy Mike, who are pushing the dial on reconciliation. Until then, stay safe and keep standing in the light. Masicho. Reconciliation Road is supported by the First Nations Major Projects Coalition. The FNMPC is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing free of charge resources to First Nations in Canada, supporting their efforts to gain equity ownership stakes in major projects being developed on their traditional territories, while ensuring that the integrity of the land is maintained for the enjoyment of current and future generations. The FNMPC envisions a future where we walk the path of the Reconciliation Road together. For more information, please visit us at fnmpc.ca. Thank you.